Do you ever lie to yourself? And the answer is yes, you lie to yourself. You do it probably more than you want to. Because we're prone to lie to ourselves, we struggle to put things in right order. We have a hard time trusting the Lord, and we have a talk in ourselves into all sorts of trouble. We, uh, we indeed believe things like, I can handle this. Have you ever said that to yourself? I can handle this, no big deal. And then maybe on a lesser thing, you believe you can eat the serving size of a, a set of potato chips. You ever open a bag of potato chips and I'm going to eat my 13 chips and that's it? The next thing you know, you, you pop that open, you go like this, and you're sucking down the last of the little chip crumbs. Oreos are only two to three Oreos per serving. <laughs> yeah, right. But there's more serious things we struggle with to put in right order, and we do believe that we can handle things. We do think that we're sufficient, and we're not sufficient. It's Jesus Christ that's sufficient. It's him. It's him alone that can help you get through things. If he was the one that died for your soul, if it was sufficient enough to have his blood cleanse you from your sin, then you can have victory through him in other areas. But we have a way of putting things out of order. We put ourselves in the front. We put ourselves ahead of him. So there is an order in which God wants us to live. Back in the Garden of Eden, we see that the devil tried rearranging those things. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in this. I'm mentioning it just as passing through. But in the Garden of Eden, God created man. He breathed into his nostril the breath of life. And out of man, out of his rib, he created a woman. And then that man and that woman, they were to have dominion over the entire world. The animals were to be under their control. And then what happens? The devil shows up. And what does he show up as? A serpent, as an animal. And the devil goes to the woman and says, eat of this. And she goes, okay. And she does it. And then she makes her way to her husband. The husband says, oh right, I'll eat it. And God looks at that and sees what they did. He judges them. He forces them to, to put clothes on or they put clothes on. They do all those types of things. And then God resets the order. He's in charge. The husband, he's the head of the household. The wife, she has to listen to him. Oh, that sounds awful. And then the animals are back in submission. But the devil wants us to put things out of order. The devil's constantly getting us to put things in wrong order. I'm going to quickly go through a couple of passages. You really don't need to turn there because I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. But before we get to the main passage, just in mention Luke 9, 59 to 62, Jesus has two people that, that want to be his disciples or he wants them to be the disciples. And he says this, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. But let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. One said he'd follow after being asked by Jesus, but he wants to bury his dad. It's certainly a good thing to take care of your family. It's certainly a good thing to deal with this situation. But he was using his family as a means of avoiding his heavenly call. One said he would follow by being asked by Jesus, but he had to say goodbye to his family. It's a good thing to bid farewell to your family when you're leaving but he was using his farewells as a, as, an away, as a way to avoid his heavenly calling. In Matthew 19, the rich young ruler, the rich young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell, go and sell that thou hast, and give it to the poor, give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Jesus again telling someone, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The rich young ruler, he apparently lived a fairly pious life, and he did have great possessions. You know, there's nothing wrong with having possessions, nothing wrong with owning things. Like, if you own something I don't, obviously that's a problem. 
But it's okay to own things, just the things can't own you. It's a good thing to have possessions and to live in a pious manner, but his possessions stopped him from his heavenly calling. There are other examples of people almost being persuaded to follow the Lord, but something dissuaded their heavenly calling. And we can convince ourselves that something good is better than the best. Something good is better than the best. The Lord has a plan for us, and we can talk ourselves and others into believing something good is better than the best that the Lord has in mind for us. In John chapter 12, the Lord has raised Lazarus from the dead. It's the last great miracle we get to see leading into the week of of his crucifixion. From chapter 12 in John all the way to 19, it's only a few days. It's only a few days. All that part of the gospel is just a few days. A A lot of the gospel of John deals with the last week of the life of Christ. All the way from 13 to 16 is Jesus meeting with his disciples. And there's a lot going on that we have to pay attention to and for good reason. There's this parallel account that we also see in Mark 14, and we're going to try to patch John 12, Mark 14 together. So what I want us to think about as we travel through this Bible Bible account is how to prioritize life, how to prioritize life. We're going to look at Martha Martha chooses serving, Mary chooses sacrifice, Judas chooses scheming, and Jesus sets things back in order. John chapter 12, together we'll read those first eight verses. We'll read verse eight together. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. By the way, it had to be pretty amazing to see Lazarus at that meal. He went from, he stinketh to, now he's at the dinner table. Pretty fascinating. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had a bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying has she kept this. And everyone in verse 8, for the poor always ye have with you. But me, ye have not always. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day you've given us. I pray as we go through this scripture in this short amount of time that we would make application that we could apply to ourselves. We know that there is a priority in life and help us to rightly do that. We're glad for your scripture. We're glad to know that there is truth out there and that we can simply follow after you. We pray that you would just be with us these few minutes. Help this preacher as he goes through your Bible. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to read the Mark passage quickly. It says this in verse 3 of Mark chapter 14. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman, Mary, having an alabaster box of ointment, of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always. And whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She is come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verify, I say unto you, verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. What a great truth that is right at the end of that. What a great truth. So we're going to walk through this. So first of all, I'm going to briefly talk about Martha. Martha, Martha, Martha. 
she. Now, you were thinking, I was saying Marsha. That's from the Brady Bunch. Most people don't know this. Young people don't know the Brady Bunch. It's just us old people that know the Brady Bunch. Martha. Where was I now? I'm lost. I'm thinking about Martha. All right, Martha. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Uh, Martha had been previously noted in the Gospels, and she was serving again back there. Uh, I, I am familiar with many people who serve frequently. I love that we have a bunch of people in our church that serve. Uh, I'm glad that I have a family that serves. Uh, my in-laws specifically are serving people. So this is not a condemnation on serving. So if you think, Pastor Longson, he's preaching against serving, I'm done. No, 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 no. We, we need all the workers we can get. Don't you think you're backing out anything. This message is called, do more and stay busy, never go home. Anyway. Uh, Martha had previously been noted as serving. Here it says in verse 38, Now it came to pass as they went, and they entered into, the, entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house, and she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet. And we'll see that again in the John chapter 12 and Mark 14 passage, and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him, and said, this is very hard to believe, but if anyone's had a sibling, they believe these words. Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Siblings never rat each other out, right? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So Jesus, in that instance, and we can go back to John chapter 12, ch chides Martha for complaining. She serves, she complains, and Jesus chides her. In the similar event here, we get to see that Mary's at the feet of Jesus. Again, Martha is serving. However, this time in the John chapter 12, she's not chided. The difference seemingly is that she served without comment about Mary, uh, what she was doing and all that. Martha was serving, and that just kind of happens and passes. Notice, if you serve, keep your mouth quiet, Jesus won't slap your hand. That's the application. That's just a very small part of the message, but I wanted to get it just because it's worth at least noting. Let's talk about Mary. Mary, she chooses a sacrifice. If in chapter 10 uh, in Luke, Mary had chosen the good part, how much more is she upping her game right here? She took expensive 300 pence or about, just so you know, this oil is very expensive. 300 pence, that's about 300 days wage. 300, that's, you know, if you look at the average American salary, it's about 60,000 a year. 60,000 a year. And she used it to anoint Jesus. Wow, that's a lot of sacrifice to give back to the Lord. Imagine taking a year's salary to give it back to the Lord. That's a pretty fascinating thing. That's a pretty big thing. She seems to have an inclination that she is preparing Jesus for his suffering. It doesn't say that she specifically has, uh, that she specifically is doing this because Jesus is going to die that week and all that. But what's, um, what's told by Jesus is that she is preparing me for burial. She is preparing to bury me. That word bury is specifically for a corpse. Someone who's dying, they get that put on them to prepare them for death. What's odd about this whole thing, all these things going on, all the distractions, all the things that you're going to see in chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, all the way to the rest, they'd be a big deal if I said, I'm getting prepared for my burial and then having a conversation. Wouldn't you stop and at least ask me a question? Wouldn't you at least stop and go, could you time out? You just used the word burying and we just use it. No, yet. what do you mean we're, we're getting you ready for burial? What, what are you talking about? Don't, wouldn't, wouldn't you be interested in that conversation? It almost just kind of slides by. And I think it's because they're distracted by other things. But that's a very, very big deal. She's preparing him for burying. Now, what does she do? Not only does she break that bottle, not only does she put that over him, she gets on her knees, she's before him, she takes the place of a servant to bow down and be before somebody. That takes a lot of humility. I love the choir song about John the Baptist saying that he must decrease so Jesus Christ may increase. It takes a lot of humility to say, for me and myself, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get on my knees and serve someone else. So that's what she's doing. But not only that, not only that, 
She undid her hair, something that Jewish women did not do in public. She humbled herself and laid her glory at his, at his feet. Uh, in 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen, it says, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her for her hair is giving her for covering. She takes her glory. She takes the hair and then wipes his feet with it. I don't have much to worry about. I don't own shampoo. I don't think about shampoo. I don't deal with all that. I had some hair at some point, but I never had a lot of hair and it certainly wasn't ever that long. But imagine wiping off someone's feet with your hair. What kind of humility is in that? What kind of sacrifice is in that? What kind of uh, positioning are you saying? You're really saying Jesus Christ is the priority in my life. Jesus Christ is a priority in my life. We'll get back to Mary in a little bit. Let's talk about Judas. Judas chooses scheming. He's a schemer. Judas is one of the disciples, the 12 disciples. The 12 disciples are the best of the best at this point. They are the disciples. They are one of the 12 that are with Jesus. Now, we know because we've read the Bible, we've gone through the Bible, that we know that he is a traitor. We know that he is going to betray Christ. We know that in chapter 18 that Jesus Christ is going to get arrested. But here at this point, they don't know that. They're not aware of that. He's one of the best church members they know. He's one of you. He's wearing a shirt. He's wearing a tie. He serves in the choir. He's a trustee. He's a deacon. He's an usher. He's one of the guys. And yet the devil's going to use him. The devil's going to use him. He's such a villain that he's really up there with an Adolf Hitler. Now bear with me for a moment. And I mean it by this. I'm not familiar with anyone that's ever named their child Adolf. Now I met someone years ago before World War II that was named Adolf. You know, like the name Adolf carried over and he was an older man. I don't know anyone naming their child Adolf. Look who I brought to church today. I brought little Adolf. That's a very unique name. No one names their child Judas. Oh, look at my little baby, little Judas Hiles or whatever, right? It's not like they don't name the child Judas. No one's like, my little baby, I hope one day he's a betrayer and a thief, and I I just can't wait. You don't name your kid Jezebel. It's one of those names that people outrightly avoid. But you know what name, a name that gets used quite a bit? I have a niece named Mary. I see we got a Mary there. We got a Mary there. We had a Mary somewhere. I saw Mary King somewhere. We got Marys all over the place. We had a Mary in the first service. We got a lot of Marys. Mary's a nice name. Such a nice name, even Jesus' mother's name is Mary. Mary is a nice name, but Judas is a bad name. He's such a villain now, it makes sense. There's no way. He's awful, but here, he's a church member. He's one of the best church members. We think of him as a villain, but God here, he's pointing him out. He's just one of the guys. Judas is often the one that's referred to as the one that betrayed Christ. He's a traitor. In chapter 12, we see that not only did he betray Jesus, but he's also called a thief. He's also called a thief. Look at that in the scripture in verse 6. Then he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He had the bag. He was the treasurer of the group. He's the one that had control of the money. And what he sees, that woman do. Could you imagine how aghast he is? If he's a thief, he wants the money, right? You ever seen your kid break something like really valuable and you're just like, oh, yeah, I colored on your, the Picasso I had my kids ruined when they're, I'm just kidding, I never had a Picasso. Breaks that bottle open, pours it out, 300 pence, 300 days wage, just gone. And Judas, what is he thinking? You know what I could have done with that money? So I, I would have tithed 10% back to the disciples, but I had 90% on whatever Judas had his eyes on. He was a thief. He was going to use it for something. He had his eyes on it. He was going to spend the money for ill reason. And there is this idea of entitlement. Do you know people feel entitled to all sorts of things? Can I just let you know a secret, a little Christian secret? You are owed nothing. There is, a, there is an account, the Smithsonian gift store, 
It was running a deficit. They were down 30, 40,000 in a year. And they figured, you know who's stealing money? That punk 25-year-old manager we hired. We know he's the one that's been stealing. They keep a camera on the punk 25-year-old manager forever long. And they watch him. They watch him at the register. They walk him, watch him walking around. They can't figure it out. He doesn't take a penny. He took $0 from the gift store. Do you know who is taking from the gift store? The elderly volunteers. They just take $20 at a time. They just take a trinket. They were owed that. They were volunteering. They were owed it. You know, when people believe they're owed something is when they're more likely to take something. If you enter Christianity with the idea that it's not about me, it's about Christ, I'm not owed anything, I owe everything to Jesus Christ, he's the one that paid it, and I owe him my life for everything, it does change the dynamic about how you are going to prioritize your life. Notice in the Mark account, this wasted oil. Here is what Judas, and I'm going to guess he's the one that instigated it. says, and there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of ointment made? And they murmured against her. In their hearts, they were like, I can't believe she wasted all that. Do you know what I could have spent it on? Judas was one of the guys. He's probably the one that created the discord. And Judas, using today's verbiage, is the good church member. He's the faithful one that's been around. He looks like a Christian. He talks like a Christian. He smells like a Christian, but he is a devil. And look what happens early in the next chapter. Chapter 13, verse 2. And the supper being ended, the devil having now put into his heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to do what? To betray him. The devilish man was breeding discontentment among the disciples. Judas knew the value of the oil. He knew it was $60,000 or whatever we'd say in today's language. Judas was a thief and a traitor, and that type of money was meant for him. Judas needed a good plan to overcome it. He needed a good plan. He wants the money, but he can't say, whoa, whoa, don't waste that oil on him. I want to go to whatever the Jewish casino was. Whatever the, whatever the thing was that Judas would be up to. He had to come up with a plan. He had to say something righteous. He had to say something that was good. What does he come up with? Ah, aha, yee I got an idea. In verse 4, then saith one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, that should betray him. Verse 5, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and what? Given to the poor. That's a good idea, isn't it? Give the money to the poor. $60,000? $60,000 can be used for the poor. Not a problem at all. In fact, Jesus told the rich young ruler to do what? Sell all his possessions and give it to who? The poor. So give it to the poor. That's not a bad idea. That is a way for Judas to get his hands on the bag, to be able to distribute it himself. It's a good plan to overcome the best plan. It's a good plan to overcome the best plan. In this case, it's a noble thing to want to help the poor with the proceeds of the oil. The priority was now moved to someone different than Jesus Christ. The priority was moved from someone else than Jesus Christ. That is the problem. Our society uses the phrase or the word priorities. Priorities is a plural. The etymology of the word priority was conceived to define the first or prime thing to be done. The use of the word priorities was almost non-existent before 1940. And until now, the use of the word priority is much more frequent than is plural. But people will say, have you set your priorities right? Do you have your priorities straight? Have you ever used that phrase? I do. In fact, in the 8 o'clock service, when I was praying, as I, after I read the scripture, I said, knowing what I was going to preach, priorities. Help us to set our priorities but do you know what? We only have one priority. There's one thing we need to focus on. Just one. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the priority. There are good things that we can do. There are many good things we can do. And so when you say, what are your priorities in life? People will say, my family is my priority. 
My church is my priority. My work is my priority. My family, my wife, my job, my, 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 my. The only thing that should be your priority is Jesus Christ. And he said, well, that kind of sounds hardcore. You know, the devil loves to put good things in front of the best things. Even when those things can include family, friends, job, or even our burdens. The devil is willing for you to do good if it means you neglect the best. Turn to Exodus chapter 20. It's a good thing to love your wife. It's a good thing to love your kids. It's a good thing to love your husband. It's a good thing to love your church. It's a good thing to go to work. It's a good thing to be a good employee. It's a good thing to give to charity. This is what it says in Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments. Verse 3. Thou shalt have, and what's that word? No other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any, make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third, fourth generation of them that hate me. We must not put things, people, or tasks in front of our relationship with Jesus. So Jesus sets things in order. Jesus sets things in order. Go back to chapter 12. Well, I kind of go to chapter 12 of John and then Mark 14. We're going to look at both of those. It says this in verse 7. Jesus said, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing has she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. And then we'll look at the Mark verse also. Let her alone, why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me, for ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do good, uh, do them good, but me ye have not always. Jesus, just like God did in the garden, sets things back in order. Leave her alone. Don't bother her. She was doing the work she was supposed to do. She was preparing his body for the burial. She had done a good work on Jesus. Her focus, her priority was Jesus. He tells them that the poor you'll have with you always, there's always an earthly need. In this room right now, there are a bunch of needy people. One time I had someone... <laughs> Church experience not here. A woman goes, hey, could I be your friend? She's like, no, you're pretty needy. You know what? You guys are a bunch of needy people. And me too. We're needy. There's always an earthly need. There's always something going on. We can never satisfy all the needs that are out there. None of us can satisfy all the needs that are out there. One of the greatest guilt we have is not solving all the earthly problems we have. There is always someone tugging on you to be priority one, priority two, priority three, priority four. Jesus lets them know that their earthly time with him was coming to an end. And Mary did what she could to put Jesus as the priority and prepare his body. Do we get the time we're supposed to have with him every day? Fine time with him every day and throughout the day. He's the one you should think about. Remember the rich young ruler? He was asked to sell what he had and follow Christ. The one that was said he needed to bury his dad. The one that needed to say goodbye. Those men were not spurned by doing something bad, but they had the wrong priority. Your priorities in Christ will not make you a lesser spouse, will not make you a lesser parent, will not make you a lesser brother, lesser sister, lesser church member, or employee. The closer you walk to Jesus Christ, the better you are going to be at any of those things. If I walk as close as I can to Jesus Christ, and I tell my wife, you're no longer the priority. Jesus Christ is the priority. And I just want to mimic and be like him all the time. Then I'm going to love my wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Because I want to be just like him. And then I'm going to look at my children. I go, sorry, kids, Jesus comes first. He is the reason why we do what we do. 
Do you know if I love Jesus Christ more and I put him at the priority, I'm going to still raise my children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, not because I've forsaken my children, but because of my relationship with Christ. Now I understand the importance of raising them that way because that's how God views me. He wants to raise me in the nurture and admonition so I can be better used for him. And as an employer or as an employee, I understand that when I work for somebody, what do I want to be? I want to be the best employee that company has so people understand that Christians are the best thing you can have. And when, they, when those employees have problems, they're going to come to me because I want to be Christ-like. And the more Christ-like you are, the closer you follow to him, the more that he is your priority. It's not secondary priority. He is the priority. It'll make you better at everything else. It is super hard because we think they're competing. You know, church and Jesus, they're competing. No, they're together. Church and my marriage, they're competing. No, they're together. You know, God and the family, they're, they're together. And the closer we walk to Jesus Christ, the more the meld, and the more you're not going to worry about it, and the more you are to sacrifice to him and not worry about what anyone else says. Do I believe that you can serve two masters? I don't believe it. You can only serve one master. Matthew 6, 24. Do I believe that when you seek righteousness, it'll be added unto you? I absolutely do. Matthew 6, 33. When someone neglects their role as a child of Christ to be a better spouse or to be a better parent or to be a better coworker, you end up devaluing all your other roles. Go back to, go to Mark 14. This is what Jesus says. I'll let you guys turn there because I want you to make sure you get all these words. Really remarkable words right here. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout this whole world, through the whole world, wherever this gospel is going to be preached throughout the whole world, the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Is it a good thing to help the poor? Yes. Is it a good thing to bury your family? Yes. Is it a good thing to, to say goodbye to mom and dad? Yes. Is it a good thing to have possessions? Sure. All of those things are good. But when you sacrifice unto Christ, you're doing the better part. And look, Judas, no one names their kid Judas. No one views Judas in a positive sense. Even if he had a good thing, it wasn't the best thing. Mary, she had the best thing in mind. And now how many Marys do we even have in this auditorium right now? Mary, as a memorial for what she did for the Lord, carries on for all eternity. Carries on for all eternity. A memorial for her that the right priority that Mary set forth is a memorial for her even today. Judas the traitor and thief is always associated as such, yet it was Mary that was immediately rebuked by her peers that day, and it was Judas that was supposedly attempting to help the poor. Let me just leave you with a few things. First, focus on your relationship with Jesus Christ. Accept, accept that you may be misunderstood when you're following after him. Do you know your family may not understand why you're following so closely after Christ? It's okay. Normal isn't all that great. I, wanna, I don't want to break it to you. Be weird. Follow after Christ. Believe that putting him first in your life will change you for the better in totality. Reject anyone attempting to wedge anything between you and your relationship with him. And know that a vibrant relationship with him will provide eternal benefits. Be comfortable with Christ as your priorities. It's not priorities, it is priority. One singular, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day you've given us. We're thankful for the example that we have with Mary in this section of scripture. Taking that expensive oil, anointing Jesus Christ for the burial on her hands and knees before the Lord, wiping his feet with her hair, caring for him, sitting, learning, wanting to grow in him. And I know that we want to do good things in our life, but let us not have good things take place of the best things. Help us to be the fathers that we need, the mothers we need to be, the church members we need to be, the children we need to be. And that doesn't come by supplanting what Jesus Christ did, but it's simply following after him with all we do. 
And I pray as we open this time of invitation that you would just prompt people to think about their relationship and that if there's anything they're putting between your son and them, that they would get that taken care of, that they would crucify the flesh today and learn how to properly prioritize their life, not having multiple, but just having a plural, or not having plural, but just having a singular Jesus Christ. Lord, we do love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.